happy to see so many uh, people in this room this morning. Uh, welcome to you all. It's really my, it's, it's my, my uh, a pleasure to host this conference and that together with uh, Peter van Dalen. Um, this conference on religious freedom in Turkey. And I would like to extend a special welcome to you, Pastor Andrew Brunson and Mrs. Brunson. It's really great that you are here today. Thank you. There was an unprecedented prayer movement uh, focused on one person. That's what I've been told by church historians. Uh, focused on me uh, through my two-year detention in Turkey, imprisonment in Turkey. And I'm so grateful for that. I don't know if there are any of you here who prayed for me. If so, then I'm grateful for that. Thank you very much. And uh, I think God used this prayer. It went to many countries around the world. Uh, millions of people were praying for me. I certainly did not feel worthy of this. I needed it. But I wondered, why are so many people praying for me? Uh, and I believe God was using all of this prayer. Uh, the intention was to pour that prayer into Turkey. And I rode a wave of prayer out of Turkey, but that also, uh, there was a tsunami of prayer that crashed into Turkey. It's going to bring great blessing to that country, I believe. And this is, I think God was uh, using my detention, my imprisonment uh, for good in that way. I'm so grateful for the ministers of Parliament here who uh, supported me. Uh, it's no small thing. Why should you do this for me? Nobody knew me. I'm not a famous person or hadn't done anything really important uh, in human terms. But uh, so many uh, MEPs signed this letter to Erdogan, the resolution. I'm so grateful for, for the support that came from you. So thank you very much. Thanks for caring about religious freedom and for using your positions of influence and your leadership uh, to advance this. So I was asked to talk a bit about uh, the story, the, uh, what we went through in Turkey, and then to have time for question and answers. So Noreen and I went to Turkey in 1993. Uh, one of the main reasons for going there is it's the largest unevangelized country in the world. Most Turks have never met a Christian, and most uh, cities in Turkey do not even have a church. Uh, we were there for 23 years uh, before we were arrested. Uh, during that time, we stayed legally. We had uh, visas to be there. We started several churches. And I want to emphasize we did everything in the open uh, before the authorities. Uh, I spent 25 years in Turkey, 23 uh, by choice and uh, two by force in the prisons. I spent 25 years total telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. I clearly and openly did this before the Turkish authorities. And even though Noreen and I suffered in Turkey, we have no regrets that we went there. We have no regrets that we did the work that made me a target for persecution. Uh, this was not a job for me. I fully believe in what we did. And I don't try to hide that my call is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. I believe he's the only way of salvation. I don't apologize for saying that. And we spent 25 years in Turkey not to undermine the system in any way, but to bring God's offer of eternal life. And we continue to love the people of Turkey uh, in spite of what we suffered. So in October 2016, uh, we were called into the police station, the local police station. We thought we were going to uh, receive uh, long-term visas. And instead, we were informed that we were going to be deported, that there was an order for our arrest to hold us for deportation. So the initial expulsion order uh, was based on a request from the Human Trafficking Department uh, of the Turkish government. Uh, I suppose they were saying we were involved in human trafficking, which is uh, ridiculous. Then when we were processed uh, into the detention center to be held for deportation, uh, the person processing us received a phone call and uh, then ticked the box that said uh, supporting a terror, terror groups. So then we realized that something unusual was happening, uh, that they were accusing us of supporting terror. The arrest itself was unnecessary. Usually when people are going to be deported, especially Westerners, certainly Americans, uh, they're given a notice of deportation, and then within a couple of weeks they have to leave the country. So there was no need to arrest us and 
uh, detain us the way they did. And if people are detained, especially Americans, will, uh, an American will usually be detained for one or two days maximum uh, while they're being deported. But we were kept there for 13 days in this detention center. Uh, total silence. Uh, we kept asking, when are you deporting us? What's going to happen? They said, Ankara will decide. Ankara will decide. This is all we heard. There were no legal or consular services. I remember watching the American consul turned away from the gates of the uh, deportation center. So they were not allowed to see us. Uh, lawyers were turned away as well. And we were denied the use of a Bible. Some friends dropped Bible off twice. Uh, the authorities there refused to allow us to have a Bible. Uh, Noreen was released after 13 days. Uh, they transferred me that night, in the middle of the night, to another detention center where I was kept in solitary confinement for 50 days. I was treated as a terrorist there. Uh, they kept telling me I was a high security a detainee. During that time, again, no lawyer was allowed. And after much pressure, finally, the United States Consul was allowed to visit. So I've been asked, why was I held? Uh, some people have said that we were swept up in the uh, arrests of tens of thousands of Turks following an attempted coup in the summer of 2016. Uh, I don't think it was we were swept up, that it was any kind of mistake. I think we were very clearly targeted. We had started to work, we'd started several churches in Turkey over the years, but in the last few years, starting in 2014, as you know, many, because of the civil war in Syria, many refugees came into Turkey. So we had started to uh, work with them to try to give uh, assistance where we could, humanitarian assistance, but also, of course, uh, our main goal and most of what we do is to tell people about the love of God, so we were doing that as well. Uh, many of these refugees happened to be Kurds, Kurdish, and so that increased the attention that the government uh, paid to us. So I think that probably the reason we were initially targeted for deportation had to do with uh, the work with the Kurds, with the refugees. I would say we didn't target the Kurds, I want to make clear. Uh, we worked with the Yazidis, with the Arabs, as well as with the Kurds. It's just that the majority of people who were coming in happened to be Kurdish at that time. Now, there were various reasons given over the detention, excuses. As I said, the initial request to deport came from Human Trafficking Department, and I was accused of supporting terror. Then the Turkish government told the United States government that they were holding me because I had gone to Syria to work with the PKK, which is a Kurdish terror group. I have never been to Syria. I do not support the PKK. The Minister of Justice uh, told, Turkish Minister of Justice told uh, Senator James Lankford when he was visiting uh, Turkey that I had attended a conference sponsored by Fethullah Gulen. You know who Fethullah Gulen is? He's the leader of the uh, Gulenist movement. Uh, so they said I was being held because I attended a conference sponsored by him, uh, that I insulted Turkey uh, when I spoke to refugees, that I helped refugees leave Turkey. None of these things were true, and really they were trying to find something that would stick so that they could hold me. My view is that we were, they did plan to deport us initially, but then somebody decided to hold on to us. I think the goal was to intimidate uh, other religious workers in the country uh, and have them self-deport because up until then no missionary had been uh, imprisoned in Turkey. And so a number of people did, I think, leave the country after that because it was a, a new cost to factor in uh, to their decision making. Are they willing to take that risk? I think after that, initially it was to Intimidate missionaries, have them self-deport, also intimidate local Christian leaders and uh, Turkish Christians because the idea is if they can do this to an American, they can do this to anybody. They're doing it to a NATO, NATO ally, a, a citizen of a NATO ally. So it was really unprecedented what they were doing. So, uh, and then they began to use me as uh, leverage to gain concessions from the United States. And somebody coined the term hostage diplomacy for this. 
As uh, Gregor pointed out, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention determined that I was held for my nationality. That's the part where they're bargaining for me, but also for my faith. So I was uh, pleased to see a UN Working Group determined that I was uh, that this was an issue of uh, religious persecution. So in, in December of 2016, uh, a senator from the United States, Bob Corker, wrote a letter. 17 United States senators signed this letter and sent it to President Erdogan. And uh, they demanded my release in that. Uh, so I know that within a couple of months of my detention, it had gone to the very top of the Turkish government. Uh, within a few days, President Erdogan gave his answer, and I was transferred from detention to a high-security prison. <laughs> and uh, arrested officially on charges of terror. I'm giving you more of the legal background. Is that okay or do you, okay, <laughs> what happened? Uh, they, they held me for many months. Uh, during this entire time, my files were sealed. So my lawyer could not even find out what the charges were against me, why they were holding me, if there was any evidence. Uh, but we learned later that I was held on uh, the witness, uh, the testimony of a secret witness. Uh, this man, we did find out who he is. Uh, he had uh, been involved in a Turkish church, but had been kicked out of the church because he was uh, committing fraud. Then he joined the Mormon church and uh, worked for them for a time. And the same thing happened. They kicked him out because he was committing fraud. Uh, then he opened a court case against the Mormon church and presented a lot of supposed evidence and accused them of all kinds of things. And a Turkish court dismissed this, saw that it was ridiculous and had no grounds. So on the day I was arrested, the prosecutor called this uh, secret witness in and uh, solicited information from him. And this time the man gave all of the evidence he had given about the Mormons in court, which had been rejected by the Turkish court, but then said, oh, and Andrew was involved as well. <coughs> and uh, so the prosecutor was seeking out information the person knew what he wanted, and based on that, then they held me, uh, based on information that Turkish courts had dismissed in the past. And the, the court knew that there was no basis for this, but uh, was also <laughs> accused then of giving a speech uh, praising Fethullah Gulen. Uh, this is uh, ridiculous. I was put into a prison cell with uh, people involved in the Gulen movement or accused of involvement in that. And since some of them were actually involved, they knew very well that I was not <laughs> because I had spent my life telling people about Jesus Christ and the Petula Gulen movement is really an Islamist missionary movement. Whatever else it may be, it is at the least an Islamist missionary movement that tries to spread Islam around the world and has opened uh, their version of Islam, has opened schools in many countries. So I was accused of being a supporter of this group. Once I was put into this high security prison, I was very isolated. This is one of the things that uh, broke me. Uh, I thought I was a relatively strong person. I had, uh, I said, if you want, if you, if you want to be popular, don't start churches in a Muslim country. So, you know, I, I think we had a high tolerance for for people not liking us. We, I had been attacked once by a gunman. There had been many threats over the years, and anybody involved in starting churches or leading a church in Turkey is going to face threats. Um, and we had exposed ourselves to some danger uh, in working with refugees on the Syrian-Turkish border. Uh, so I thought that I was a relatively tough person, <laughs> uh, but I broke in prison <laughs> pretty badly. And one of the reasons for that was the isolation. The solitary confinement was very difficult. Uh, the lack of certainty. Uh, I did not know how long they were going to keep me if they would ever release me. And as I'll mention in a few minutes, at one point there were three life sentences hanging over my head. So I did not know if I'd ever get out. And uh, when I was moved to the high security prison, this pressure increased. Uh, I was put in a cell built for eight people, but there's not enough room in the prison to put all of the people they've arrested. Uh, although they're building prisons at a very fast rate now in Turkey. So our cell was overcrowded. It was built for eight people, but there were over 20 of us in the cell. Uh, those cells are the way the high security prisons are run. Uh, you never leave the cell. They're 24-7 in that cell with the same people 
all the time. So it's possible to spend years in prison and never meet someone outside that cell. So it was a very pressured environment for me. My letters were confiscated. The letters I tried to write to Noreen, the letters she wrote to me, we had no other communication for, for some time. They took them and said that I was using secret code to communicate to my wife about Fetullah Gulen. So I was completely cut off. No Bible was allowed for months. So I was isolated by my culture, by my life experience. Uh, although I speak Turkish, I was obviously isolated somewhat by my language, but especially by my faith. I was the only Christian uh, throughout my time in prison. I had no contact with other Christians other than my wife when she was allowed to visit me. In March 2017, Secretary of State, American Secretary of State Tillerson, uh, met with Erdogan, and Erdogan said, we're going to resolve this in the next couple of weeks. Uh, an indictment will be issued. Uh, this is often the way that they will release people, because the court could at any time let someone uh, go. Even if they continue with the trial, they can uh, uh, release them and allow them to leave the country. So we had great hope then uh, that President Erdogan was willing to uh, move this forward. Immediately after that, the prosecutor, so there's a very close relationship between the prosecutors and the government in Turkey. It's not an independent uh, uh, legal system. Uh, Noreen, uh, the prosecutor told Noreen the same thing. In a couple of weeks, we'll wrap this up. They didn't. <laughs> I think he changed his mind. Uh, and then in May, there was... Uh, a summit between President Trump and President Erdogan. And in that summit, President Trump requested my release three times. This really surprised all of Turkey. They were asking the day after the summit on all the news programs on television, why, when there are so many things to discuss between the countries, why is President Trump asking three times in the short summit for the release of this priest? Uh, so I waited to see what would happen. The next day, a government-led propaganda campaign started and uh, much of the media in Turkey is uh, controlled by the government. And they accused me of many things across all media platforms. I remember the uh, foreign secretary, uh, foreign minister of Turkey, Çavuşoğlu, uh, saying that, or before the summit, he had said that, uh, told the American government, we were going to release Brunson two weeks ago, but he refused to leave the country. <laughs> I thought, really? <laughs> I wanted to stay in prison? <laughs> so that's the kind of communication that was coming from the Turkish government, saying that they, were going, they released me and I wouldn't leave. Um, anyway, after the summit, Çavuş Ali came on uh, the national television again and said that they had proof that I was a Gulenist, that I was also supporting the PKK, and that they had turned all of this evidence of my guilt over to the U.S. government. And so it was clear uh, that they were not responding positively to the U.S. request to release me. Then this propaganda campaign driven by the Turkish government, I was called a military spy, a uh, member of the PKK, that I was a special forces officer with many American special forces officers in Turkey trying to undermine the country, that I was the head of the CIA in Turkey, no, wait, the head of the CIA and all of the Middle East, wait, they said that I was uh, offered the, they were going to make me director of the CIA if only I had succeeded in the attempted coup in the summer of 2016. So um, they also said that I, would want to, that I threatened to cut the heads off of Turks. Uh, so an enemy of Turkey, a traitor, someone who hates Turks. All of this was untrue, of course. Right after the summit on May 22nd, Noreen received a phone call after this propaganda campaign had started, uh, and she was told to uh, pack her bags and be ready to leave, pack some clothes for me, because the U.S. government had come to an agreement with the Turkish government. They had made a deal. Uh, two days later, she got another phone call. Uh, the Turks have pulled out of the deal. They've broken the agreement. Uh, they've demanded more. And this became a pattern. There were several times when there was an agreement and the Turkish government at the very end would make higher demands and the U.S. would not give in to those demands. 
Uh, they had a very long ask list for me. So although they've said many times this was a completely uh, in the hands of the courts, obviously they were shopping me behind the scenes, trying to get as much as they could. And this is where that uh, hostage diplomacy term was coined. In August of 2017, they rushed me into court and accused me of, of helping to plan the coup, trying to overthrow the government, the Constitution, and the uh, Parliament. And this brought an automatic three life sentences in solitary confinement with no parole. They added military espionage, another 20 years, plus the original charges of terrorism. So that was going to be a long time. <laughs> One life sentence is enough, I think. <laughs> so it was three life sentences plus. Uh, the next day I learned why they had rushed me into court. And they did this very quickly. Uh, I could tell that it was rushed and I didn't know why, but the very next day, there was a, uh, the Turkish government published Decree 694, Article 74, <laughs> which basically said that a new, uh, there was a new order that Erdogan could uh, exchange or uh, return foreign prisoners to their countries. And so this was messaging, political messaging. Uh, we've given him, he's going to get three life sentences, so it increases pressure on the United States to pull me out. But... The president has the authority to exchange if he can get something in return. Very soon after that, Erdogan publicly began, stated that he wanted to trade me for Fethullah Gulen. Um, send us the imam, we'll send you back the priest. So then it was public that this is, they had been trading for me. And finally, the Turkish government decided to put me on trial in April of 2018. Uh, this had been more than 18 months after I was first detained. They issued an indictment uh, that accused me of Christianization, uh, which is not a crime <laughs> in Turkey, but that's what they accused me of. And that's not what we were trying to do. We have, I want to make clear, we've spent years in Turkey telling people about God's love and Jesus Christ, but we never have tried to... Uh, We have never forced the gospel of Jesus Christ down people's throats. We basically, I don't argue about Islam. I don't talk about the Quran. I don't talk about the Prophet Muhammad. I only talk about Jesus and about what the Bible says about him, and only to people who are interested in asking questions. So the idea of that we would be involved in Christianization just is, it doesn't make any sense, even though that is uh, not illegal in Turkey anyway, even if it were going on. Uh, in the trial, there were three kinds of witnesses. There were secret witnesses, and this is used a lot right now, especially in the current uh, political climate in Turkey. And we were accused of all kinds of things I, that were very puzzling to me. I'll just share a couple of them so you have an example. Uh, a secret witness said that uh, I had taught that the Kurds are the 13th tribe of Israel that has been lost. And... Uh, this is something that is taught throughout the Christian church, and I had been teaching this in Turkey, and therefore I was trying to set up, because the Turks are the lost tribe of Israel, the 13th tribe, then I had been trying to focus on them and set up a new state for them, a new country, which meant dismantling Turkey. Uh, I had never heard of this before, even though apparently it's taught throughout the Christian world. <laughs> so uh, it was uh, very puzzling to me, and the judges took this very seriously. Obviously, that is not a teaching of Christianity. Another thing was, uh, uh, it sounded like a James Bond type of movie. And there's an organization called CAMA, the secret witness said. C-A-M-A, CAMA. And the National Security Agency in the United States, the FBI, the CIA, and all Christian churches uh, are under this organization. Uh, and so anybody, any religious worker who goes overseas is run by this shadowy deep state organization that is involved with all the intelligence agencies of the U.S. And one thinks, well, the, this sounds laughable. It sounds like James Bond, a spy movie. But then you look at the judges, and they're not laughing. <laughs> they're taking it very seriously. And in fact, they say, please, explain more about this to us. So it, it, it was amazing to me to see this kind of uh, uh, accusation given uh, any room in a, in a court. So there were secret witnesses. We found out who all of them 
are, uh, but we're not allowed to say who they are, so we're not allowed to question them in a way that would uh, impeach their testimony, because to say their names, expose their identity, is, a, is another crime in Turkey. The other kind of witnesses were some of them had spent time in a, in a church in Turkey, uh, and they said that I was involved with the PKK, and according to them, we had open concerts praising the PKK, had waved their flags in our church, gave speeches in public, uh, wore PKK t-shirts. If you know anything about Turkey, this is not really possible to do. They will very quickly arrest you, but supposedly we did this in public on a very crowded, in our church, which is on a very crowded street with open windows and doors. So everybody could see this. So I, you know, I, I challenged this and I said, how, I said to the judge, how can you accept this? Uh, from these witnesses just based on their testimony when they provide no evidence. They provide no, no pictures, no video, no sound. Uh, there are no text messages or emails or anything at all uh, or, or cell phone records that show that we're even in the same area. Uh, why, how can you accept their statements with no evidence provided? And he told me they don't have to provide any evidence. Their testimony is all they need to give. And this, this just shocked me. It was very frustrating to me. How can I defend myself against things like that? Then there were prisoners who saw an opportunity to get out of prison early or to get transferred to a better prison. So they had learned about me through the, the media that was constantly uh, talking about me. Uh, and so they made up stories about me. I remember one who came forward and described how he had seen me with a number of top PKK leaders and top Gulenist leaders. And then my lawyer uh, asked him, how many times have you been in prison before? Oh, twice, is it three times? Then my lawyer said to the judge, this man has been convicted of fraud 14 times, and there are 24 outstanding arrest warrants for him. The judge said, of what relevance is that? How can this not be relevant? The man has been convicted multiple times of fraud, and yet you're a what? Yeah, and and yet his testimony is being accepted. So I was attempted of accused of attempting to Christianize the Kurds and use them to split Turkey and set up a Christian state. All evidence presented against me was actually my church work. Emails text messages, all showing that I was involved in church work. I said, well, this just proves what I'm saying, that I am very clearly and openly, I don't deny it, I am here to tell people about Jesus, and I set up churches. So this is what I do. And they said, well, uh, you're using your religious work as a cover for supporting terror. So I was not allowed to, all the evidence presented against me, of actual evidence taken from me, was actually proved that I am what I said, but they said it was evidence of terror. And I was not allowed to make a defense. I could not present any exculpating evidence, and no witnesses were allowed. One witness was allowed. The others were denied. During this time, President Erdogan admitted privately to U.S. senators and to President Trump that he knew that the case against me was, was uh, not just, that the witnesses were lying, and yet publicly then he talked about me as the dark priest with ties to terror. So there's a real disconnect. He knew that it was not true, but he used it anyway uh, for his own purposes. I was released to house arrest after my third, uh, well, shortly after my third trial. That's because there was an agreement that fell through. President Trump became very angry at this <laughs> and demanded that uh, something be done. So I was released to uh, house arrest uh, during this, shortly after that, uh, the United States imposed sanctions uh, on Turkey when there was no movement. There had, there had been an agreement that Turkey broke, and there had been some things agreed to, and then they made higher demands that the U.S. refused. Um, and so this was something that finally spurred the United States administration to take an unprecedented step of imposing sanctions on the NATO ally. Uh, there, are, there were already structural problems in Turkey with their economy, 
but this kind of tipped it over. It also allowed them to blame all of their uh, economic problems on, on the U.S. and specifically on me. So I did become one of the most hated people in Turkey. Uh, the Economist magazine said that I was the most expensive prisoner in the world. Uh, the Turkish uh, stock market lost $40 billion, uh, and their currency crashed. Of course, we don't want that to happen. There are many people who suffered for it, but this was, this was what happened. The night before my fourth trial session, <coughs> nobody knew what was going to happen, whether it'd be released or not. Uh, the Turkish government made a demand for $1.9 billion. That's billion, not million. That's with a B. $1.9 billion for my release. Um, they were not given any money, <laughs> but they were demanding it. And then I was released on October 12th, uh, the next day after they made that demand. I was convicted of supporting terror, uh, sentenced, and then suddenly released. When they convicted me, I, I, I wasn't allowed to present a defense, and I was actually, uh, I was surprised. I thought, after all this pressure, after all this prayer as well, is this what's going to happen after the economy has crashed? Are they still, is Erdogan still going to hang on to me? What will it take? But this was actually the mechanism they were using to save face, uh, to justify having kept me for two years, to say, actually, we have convicted him of terror. He's officially involved in terror crimes. Uh, they imposed a sentence, but then they released me for time served while the appeal, I was released to appeal, and then my, um, I was allowed to leave the country, which basically means when they removed the travel restriction, they're saying, please leave the country now. <laughs> so then there was the race to get me to the airport uh, the, for, to board a United States Air Force plane that was sent from Germany and to get us out of the country before a tweet or a comment by some official would anger the president of Turkey and he would change his mind. Uh, so when we finally crossed out of Turkish airspace, <laughs> it was a great relief to us that finally, yes, we were free. In the end, I say if God had not been on my side, I would still be in a Turkish prison. And again, I'm thankful to those who advocated for me here in the European Parliament. So I've, I've just told, spent most of this time uh, on uh, the human story, and there, there's a parallel story. Uh, behind all the political intrigue and the, the, the political maneuvering, the intimidation, the persecution, there was another story uh, that I called the God story, and I think of God as the grandmaster chess player. And the Turkish government stole two years of my life, but God has redeemed those stolen years. And God took what was intended to harm me, and it did harm me. It was very painful. Uh, but he turned it around to bring much good. And first, he redeemed it for me personally. I had many questions and doubts. Uh, I struggled with suicide in prison and uh, was very broken. But God rebuilt me in my brokenness. And in the end, I came out of prison with my faith having been tested and tested and proven true. And this was very important for me. Uh, secondly, I became a magnet for prayer, as I mentioned earlier. There was an unprecedented prayer movement, and millions around the world, including many in Europe, prayed for me. So there was this tsunami of prayer that crashed into Turkey, and I came to understand that Erdogan put me in prison, but God was using this. Uh, it actually was an assignment from God, I believe. And our goal all along has been to bring blessing to Turkey, and through my suffering, uh, I think much blessing will eventually come to Turkey. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Turkey now with religious freedom. Uh, compared to other countries in the region, there is more religious freedom in Turkey uh, than in some. There is some legal harassment, but most of the difficulty Christians would face comes from their family, from the, their uh, social surrounding. Uh, some police at a lower level uh, would harass them in their workplace, uh, neighbors. So there's intimidation, there are threats, there's loss of job. Sometimes a spouse will divorce if uh, someone becomes a Christian, if the other spouse becomes a Christian, they're regarded as traitors. Uh, for a pastor, there will almost certainly be threats. And there is heightened tension now. 
Uh, Turkey, of course, has been a Muslim country for a very long time, but Erdogan has taken it in a much more Islamist direction. Uh, he made this clear from the beginning, but it was incremental, and it has sped up significantly in the last six, seven years, and even more so after the coup when he was able to uh, rule by decree. Uh, Erdogan uh, said, in relation to my case, he said, to be a Turk is to be a Muslim. So that's very clearly defining what's acceptable for Turks. So there was a pr propaganda campaign, as I mentioned, that uh, I was a target, uh, painting me as a someone who hates Turks and who wants to harm them, who wants to destroy the country, and is a traitor. Uh, they focused that on me, but they were actually painting all the Christians in Turkey by painting me in this way. I'm a representative Christian as a leader. And so, in a sense, they were painting all Christians in Turkey with the same brush. And there has been an increase in, significant increase in hate speech related to my case, following my case, uh, driven by the media with government support. In Turkey, hate speech is very dangerous and has led to atrocities in the past. So there's a heightened tension. There was already uh, distrust and uh, animus toward Christians, but this has now been... Um, it, is, it has ramped up. It is what? It's at a higher level now. And I, th I think the environment has been created so that when there is persecution and uh, increased persecution and violence against Christians, now most Turks will uh, are conditioned to say they deserve it. Uh, as I mentioned, Turkey has gone in a more Islamist direction. There are more religious schools now. Students who graduate from religious the Islamist schools are given preference uh, in the university system. There's this increase of Islam uh, merged together with nationalism that has been driven by Erdogan. And he has stated openly his goal to remake Turkey uh, by 2023. That's only four years from now, and that's the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the Turkish Republic under Atatürk, almost 100 years ago. So he has made very clear he wants an Islamist country, and he wants to lead the Sunni Muslim world. Um, so there's what I would call a rise of the Ottoman spirit. Uh, there's a support for radical Islam, uh, seeking influence in the Balkans, seeking influence in Africa, building mosques in many countries, and uh, as I said, trying to use... They cannot recreate the Ottoman Empire, obviously, but they can try to recreate the influence that it had in other countries. I want to tell you about a dream I had in prison um, that I believe came from God. And in the Bible, there are several examples where God uses a dream to communicate to people. And this has happened only a few times in my life. But in prison, in, I had just been put into high security prison in December of 2016. And I had a, a very a vivid dream of... Turkey, Russia, and Iran beginning to move together in a very dark alliance. Uh, I woke up from this just bathed in sweat and uh, with a lot of fear because I thought if, if, this is, if this happens, then the West will lose a lot of its leverage and then I'm stuck in a Turkish prison for the rest of my life. Now, when I had this dream, the, the timing is, is significant. It's important because uh, it makes it... Uh, more difficult to dismiss this is just my imagination. It, uh, at the time I had this dream, Turkey and, well, Turkey and Iran have been uh, historically their enemies. Uh, Turkey and Russia were not getting along. Uh, Turkey had shot down a Russian fighter jet. Uh, Russia had responded by imposing sanctions that had hurt the Turkish economy. So they were not getting along well at all, and they were almost opposite sides of the war in Syria. Uh, so I thought this is completely counterintuitive that they would begin moving together in this kind of alliance. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, I met with an American consul shortly after that, and I told him this is what I saw in my dream. I have met also with a high-ranking U.S. diplomat who uh, is well acquainted with Turkey. Um, and I told him about this dream, and he said, oh, that will never happen. It's not in Turkey's best interest to move away from the West and toward that kind of alliance. I said, I agree with you, it's not in Turkey's best interest. But this is what I believe God showed me. And within three or four days of having that dream, a Turkish policeman assassinated the Russian ambassador to Turkey. Uh, 
I thought, surely this is going to drive Putin and Erdogan even further apart. But it had the opposite effect. <laughs> I still don't understand it. They began to move together. And so what we see over the last, uh, since I had that dream, I see them moving more and more closely together in an alliance that does not make sense. I think one of the reasons that, uh, uh, well, many Western analysts, uh, when they look at these things, intelligence, uh, uh, diplomatic analysis, does not factor in that there are... Um, there are spiritual uh, forces at work as well in the world, because in the view of many of these analysts, there is no spiritual world. Uh, and so it does not make sense that they move together, except that there are, there's a, there are spiritual factors at work here as well, bringing them together. So I think that I believe God showed me the direction they're going, and the three years since then have proven that that is actually happening, even though it's hard to explain. And the point of this is that nobody has lost Turkey. In the United States, I know there are many questions about this in political arena. Who's, who's lost Turkey? What have we done to drive them away? How have we offended them? And what can we do to b gain their trust and win them back? And so there's uh, appeasement. What can we do to appease the Turks? And I suggest that there is nothing you can do because... They haven't, they're not moving away because they're offended. Erdogan is moving away because he's an Islamist, because he has a different agenda, and because there are other spiritual factors involved in this that are driving him away. I don't think that he's returning, and that I think that anything that's done to appease him and gain, rebuild the trust, supposedly, is not, is not going to bring them back. So this has implications for the future of the real relationship of the West with Turkey. Um, that you know more about than I do. I think there's going to be an increase in persecution of Christians. Things are going to become worse before they become better. And as you deal with countries in the Middle East and uh, religious freedom, uh, I would urge you to not look at what they say, but look at what they do. In the Middle East, uh, people often don't say what they really intend to do. Uh, I would also push for re reciprocity. I think of an example is Turkey pays the salaries of many, many imams uh, working in Germany, and the German government gives them uh, visas to work there. At the same time, uh, we know several uh, German uh, church leaders who have been expelled from Turkey in the last year, <laughs> and they were uh, serving the Turkish churches. Uh, so there's no reciprocity. While Germany gives visas to uh, Turkish imams, the Turkish government kicks out the very few Germans who are helping the Turkish church. A German a friend of mine was recently expelled and talked with uh, the German government, and they said they would not put pressure on Turkey because they don't want to offend the Turkish government. The relationship is too important. And I wonder if the Turkish government is as concerned about offending European governments. It looks like a one-way street. Anyway, that, those are the comments I had planned on.